Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. Got a good crowd. Thankful that you're here. I'm going to go through a few announcements this evening before we get into our devotional and our Bible class. Uh, let me see. Steve, would you lead us in an open prayer? Or, or a prayer at the appropriate time? All right. I will. <laughs> Uh, probably most of you have heard Brother Bill uh, Mears had a rough day. They thought he had had a stroke. It looks like the tests are showing that that's not the case, but he's having similar symptoms. So he is at, as of about an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, he was at uh, the medical center in PCU 920. I don't know what PCU stands for. At USA. So keep them in your prayers. Uh, they're still running tests and observing him. Um, but uh, that I, he was supposed to be getting a pacemaker. His heart rate had dropped into the 30s. And um, his speech was slurred. They're supposed to be getting a pacemaker, I think she said, on the 18th, but it looks like they're trying to move that up as quick as possible now. So that's the latest that I have on him, if anybody else has any updates. Let's not forget to pray for uh, others, the Masseys. Um, Brother Glenn's good to see him tonight. Did I see Terry here Sunday? I thought so. I didn't get to speak to him, but that's good. That's very good. Glad to see him. Heather and many others. Any we need to mention or update? It's good to see Ann. Ann, where are they? Well, good. That's good to know. Said the Masseys were here this morning. Uh, Rachel is on her way here. She, she should be here before <laughs> services are, are done with, probably right in the middle. I'm watching her like the kids watch Santa Claus around Christmas time on my, <laughs> on my find my app. Micah went to work today for the first time, just for a couple of hours, he's getting getting some training in, and he'll go tomorrow, and he's on the schedule, so uh, y'all go see him at Rouse's. This is Marcy's cousin, Eddie Ernest. Where is he? I mean, is that here? Parish? I don't know. Probably so then. Eddie Ernest, he's had several head injuries, they say, and COVID three times, and that seems to be complicating the mental issues that he's having. He's losing his memory, so... Keep him, keep that family in your prayers, the earnest family. Any others need to mention tonight? In our devotional, as we think about uh, Micah getting a job, a young man, I heard this story of a farmer who was looking for some help for the summer. A young man came and uh, applied for the job, and the farmer began to ask him some questions. Can you... Uh, milk a cow? Can you run this machine? Can you know, do you know how to, to do this or that around the farm? And his answers were, no. No, I don't, but I'll learn. No, I don't. I don't know how to do that. And so after kind of interviewing the young man, and the farmer said, well, what do you know how to do, son? He said, I know how to sleep when the wind blows. I know, it says sleeping in the rain, but same idea. I know how to sleep when the wind blows. He didn't ask him anything further, 
But he gave the young man a chance, and they worked together for a few days. He began learning some of those things that he was asking him about. He picked up on it pretty quickly. It wasn't too long before a storm rolled in one evening. And uh, as it began to get pretty bad, the young man was already in his bed asleep, just as he had said, sleeping when the wind blew and when the rain was coming down. The farmer, instead of waking up the young man, he went out because he was concerned about the livestock and everything. He said, I, I need to go check on the animals. And he went and saw that they had already been secured and put in place and weren't going to escape. They were settled down. He thought he needed to go check on the hay. It's probably blowing all around the barn. And he went and checked on it, and it had already been tarped and, and held down, and it was not going anywhere either. And so he finally understood what the young man meant. He knew how to prepare. He could sleep when the wind blew because he had done everything he needed to do to prepare for that event. And the same thing needs to be true for us. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives us the parable of the ten virgins. And it's about being prepared. It won't be long in our lives before those chilly winds of death begin to blow. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we can always be prepared. We can sleep every night knowing that we've done everything that we need to do to be in that right relationship with God, to be approved of Him, to be pleasing in His sight. That begins with obeying the gospel. It begins by putting Christ on in baptism based upon our faith and repentance from sins, turning away from worldliness to seeking God's will in everything in our lives, making confession. And upon that confession, we are immersed in water. Our sins are washed away. And at that moment, we should be as much as any other time in our lives, ready, prepared for the end, pure and clean. We're newborn babes in Christ at that moment. We don't know what we're going to know later on in our lives, but we're ready then and there. As we go through our lives, sometimes we make mistakes. We slip up. We do things and say things we know we shouldn't. If we're walking in the light, God forgives us. If we repent and confess those things, God forgives us. Sometimes we deny what we've done. Sometimes we try to make other people, uh, we try to hide it from other people. What we should do as Christians is be willing to confess and be open with what we do in our own personal lives so that those sins aren't held to our account. And so tonight, I hope that you'll think about, can you sleep at night at ease, whether it rains, whether it storms, or whether it's a beautiful day like today, knowing that you're ready for whatever comes. If you need to obey the gospel tonight, we encourage you to do so. If you need prayers for any reason, we invite you to come now as we stand and sing this song to encourage you. Jesus is Let's hear his voice, hear him today. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this opportunity to gather together as Christians to study a portion of your word, to assemble together, to build each other up. Lord, we thank you for your love for us that you gave your only begotten Son, that we may be saved, calling on upon the Lord, doing the things that he's asked us to do. Lord, we ask your blessings upon those mentioned tonight. 
through the trials and tribulations that they're going through. We ask you to bless them. Bless the families. Bless the caregivers. We ask you to strengthen them through this time. Strengthen us through this time as well, Lord. As we study a portion of your word, as we grow stronger in the faith. That our love becomes overflowing. That we can flow out to the world to teach the gospel. Plant the seed is all we're required to do. Plant it so it can grow, so your church can grow. Yes, you be with us and guide us. Forgive us when we err. All these things rest in Christ's name. Amen. With what? No, that's what I told you. Let me check one more time, see where she is. in Mount Vernon. Right there at the Dollar General in Mount Vernon. <laughs> okay. Say what? I know, I know. I know it. It'll take forever. All right, we are uh, in the middle of studying the song, Blessed Assurance, we've had some, some great conversations. I have loved this study. I don't just mean just for this song, but going back to when we started this, it has just been so enriching to me. I hope it has been for you. Um, not going to get to much of the lyrics tonight. Based on what we talked about last week, uh, we're going we're gonna to plant our feet and, and talk about premillennialism tonight. That's a mouthful. Sarah was trying to be able to, she was trying to learn how to say it on the way in. <laughs> it came out all kind of funny. But we'll sing the song and then we'll get into a study of those concepts. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. in his love. 
This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. So based on that second verse, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. We talked a little bit last week about the rapture. We were right at the end and didn't have time to get into it very deeply. So I think that's what we're going to do tonight is talk about the rapture and what it is part of. We mentioned, first of all, that that's not necessarily what she's referring to in this song. Uh, and when we sing it, of course, that's not what we have in mind, the denominational, the premillennial idea of the rapture. Rapture can just mean uh, abounding and excessive joy in our hearts. And, and that's, I believe, the way she's using it, and that's especially the way that we uh, sing it. Uh, but... That did bring up a question, and I think it's a good one, and one we need to consider about what the rapture is. It's part of premillennialism. But before we get to premillennialism, we have to understand uh, one of those ologies, one of those studies, one of those, oh, I don't know. Usually when you think of an ology, it has something to do with a science, right? But I guess it's just the study of something. In fact, the rapture, the um, area monthly preachers meeting get together is tomorrow over in Somerdale, hosted by Brother Billy Lambert and David Sargent. And they are going to be, if we can make it, Rachel and I are going to try to go, but um, they're talking about the rapture tomorrow. So this is something that people want to know about and have on their minds and hear about. But I have to tell you, after going through this now for two solid straight days, I don't know if I know it any better than I did before. It is a confusing doctrine. It is, it is just... Did you? Well, what was the name of it? Rapture prepar preparedness soon? Preparation soon. Well... Uh, that doesn't tell us a whole lot about who they are and what they believe, but I'm, I'm going to have to go check that one out. <laughs> no, don't do that. So before we get to the rapture, before we even get to premillennialism, we have to ask ourselves, what is eschatology? Um, do you know? Okay, you have not heard that. Well, this is a word that you need to know. It's, uh, it's a weird word, but it simply means the study of the end times. Eschatology is the study of things pertaining to the end of time. Premillennialism is an eschatological view. Premillennialism is a doctrine regarding the end of time, how it's going to take place and what is going to happen. So that's a word we need to be familiar with. And it's, uh, this, this may put a, a different wrinkle on it for you. A few years back, I spoke at the Florida School of Preaching Lectureship. And my topic was, get this, Eschatological expectations of the intertestamental period. That was my, <laughs> I, was, I was at a loss. I feel like that was one of the, I did not do a very good job. I didn't think I did. It, it, it felt like that. It kind of did, that they were just picking on me. Think about that, though. The intertestamental period, the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. Do you know anything about that period of time? What happened during that time? The history of the Jews during that time? It's interesting. But the idea that the people in that specific time had an eschatology, 
they had a view of end time things ought to tell you something about this field of study to the Jews either in the intertestament period time or even before under the law of Moses in the period of time covered by the Old Testament what would they have thought about the end of time? If they understood God's word correctly, if they understood God's revelation to them in the way that we do, I know they couldn't really. I think that some of the prophets had a very clear understanding of God's ultimate plan, his ultimate will for humanity to bring the church into existence. If they understood anything even close to God's ultimate plan for the world, then the Jews could have had an understanding of their eschatology that that would mean that they knew that time as we know it couldn't come to an end until after God had fulfilled his prophecies to them. The Jews and the people living in the intertestament period of time, they wouldn't wouldn't have had any reason to be concerned about how the world was going to end, how time was going to end, because it couldn't happen until God had fulfilled his prophecies to them to bring Jesus into the world through the tribe of Judah all the signs and things that were to go along with him. So our view, though, of eschatology would be somewhat different. We know from the way that God has revealed himself to humanity that we're living in the last days. We're living in the last dispensation. When this period of time is over, time is going to be over. The world's going to be over. We're not waiting for another dispensation that's going to be an important term tonight and so our understanding of eschatology might be different from what the Jews were thinking about their eschatology would have been pertaining to the end of the Jewish age that would have been the end of time that they were concerned about so it 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 can mean different things in different uh, it, it can refer to different time periods eschatology can So, that's what that word is about, what it means. Premillennialism is a, Michael, come up here, is one view. Premillennialism is not specific to, not yet, hold on. I've got a couple of things I want us to go through. You can sit down, sorry. Uh, Brother, that is small, isn't it? Can you read it? Okay. I'm having a squint. Um, Brother Clifford provided me with some four charts that go along exactly with what we're going to be talking about tonight um, that he produced by hand based on a book that he has in his library um, that are now about 40 years old. Is that what you said? At least that. Uh, And and they do a great job of illustrating uh, these views. Uh, Premillennialism, though, before we can get to premillennialism, we have to ask that question about eschatology. But there are some other questions also that we might want to keep in mind as we go through a study of eschatology and premillennialism specifically. Has all biblical prophecy been fulfilled? Any ideas? Any que- Any thoughts on that? Has that? Is that a question that you've ever entertained before? Not all, okay? And that's the way most people believe in, the, in the, the position that we hold. Because there are prophecies of Scripture regarding the end of all time. There are some, though, who believe that all biblical prophecy has been fulfilled. And that's another term that I'm not going to get into, but it's one that you might want to be familiar with as well. Preterists. And there is full preterism, and there's partial preterism, and there's different types of preterism. But preterists believe that all biblical prophecy has been fulfilled, that everything written in Scripture is about things that have already 
happened. In fact, you, are you familiar with the name Max King? Do you remember a controversy a couple of decades back regarding a preacher in the church named Max King? He is a he believes in a realized eschatology is his position, or was his. He's long since passed away. Uh, believing that Jesus came back in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, set up his kingdom, and we are now living in um, heaven on earth. That's the extreme. That's the extreme that a person can go to when considering that question. Has all biblical prophecy been fulfilled? Preterists believe that it has, and full preterism uh, goes to even that extreme. But that is then a question to keep in mind as we go through this. Another question that we might want to keep in mind is, who are God's people today? Okay, the church. We understand that because we understand the church. We understand what the Old Testament says about the church. We understand what the New Testament says about the church. We understand God's true purpose for the church. But when we get to, to discussing premillennialism, there are some misconceptions, some misunderstandings about the purpose of the church. And this was the main thing I heard about premillennialism all my life growing up, is that according to premillennialism, the church is just a stopgap that Jesus failed in his mission, was rejected by the Jews, and so God inserted the church. But that only pertains to one specific type of premillennialism. In fact, there is a term that it, uh, the church is a... Oh, I'm gonna, I'll come across it when we're going through it. Uh, parentheses, just to get us to the time when Jesus returns and is successful in establishing an earthly kingdom. Uh, that was my understanding of premillennialism, but that's only one particular type. Uh, but according to that kind, that that branch of premillennialism, dispensationalism, the Jews then are still God's special people, and Jesus is going to come back and establish a kingdom in Jerusalem consisting of Jews. But the church was just kind of a intermediary to get from the first century to whenever Jesus returns again. So that's another question to keep in mind. Who are God's people today? That concept and that doctrine has influenced American politics for a long time. I don't know if you're aware of that or understand how that's the case, but it has because a lot of men who have led this country for a long time have been under the belief that the Jews today are still God's chosen people, protected people, that Jesus is going to come back to earth and establish a kingdom at Jerusalem. So this concept, is this doctrine is far-reaching in, uh, in its influence. Now I want us to look, before we get into any of these specifics, one verse to me that kind of settles some of this idea, because a lot of all of these really center on the uh, center around the idea of Jesus' second coming. When when that's going to happen, the order of things. In my study of these different views of premillennialism, it wasn't so much what's actually going to happen; it's the order of those things that seem to be important. And not just that, but among those who hold these views, it's very important which other men held these views. They are very caught up in well, this person believed that, and that person believed that. And I don't worry about all that. I try to stick with what the Bible says. But one passage I want us to look at that kind of settles a lot of this for us is Jeremiah 22, verse 30. And I want you to mark this if you, if you haven't, if you mark in your Bibles. Jeremiah 22, verse 30. You remember, Josiah was the great king. He had, I get it confused, three sons who reigned after him. It wasn't his son and then that son's sons, but uh, he had three sons, I believe, who also served as king. Jeconiah was one of them. If I, if I have my order right in these things, and 
Jeconiah or Coniah in verse 24 uh, was a terrible king and tried to rebel against Babylon, I believe is the case. And because of what he did as the king, um, this is the prophecy that Jeremiah re made regarding him. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. This prophecy says that Jeconiah, Coniah, would never have a descendant, a son, sit on the throne and rule in Judah. It's not going to happen. It didn't happen in the rest of their history as a nation, in the rest of their history as kings. I think there was only one king after him, but it wasn't him. It was his brother or his uncle. I, I get those last three or four kings confused. Uh, but it wasn't Jeconiah's son. Jesus is a descendant of the kings. He's a descendant of David. He's a descendant of Josiah. He would be a descendant of Coniah. Jesus can't come back to Jerusalem and rule on earth as a king sitting on the throne of David over an earthly kingdom. It's not going to happen. And all of these different types of premillennialism really center around that idea. Jesus literally coming back to earth to rule. So, to me, that one verse, and there are several others uh, that we could go through and study, especially about the purpose of the church, understanding that it's not an afterthought in God's mind, that this was God's plan from the beginning of time, Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 3. Uh, several passages that we could look at just really completely defeat premillennialism at the, out, out the outset, um, but we're not going to get to all of that tonight. I want us to look at the different types of premillennialism, first of all. All right, Mike, now you can. Yes, sir. Right. That's true. Yes. There, that's a good point. Uh, what we're talking about is millennialism. Different views regarding the idea of that thousand years that is mentioned in Revelation 20, verse 7. Uh, and, and it's whether the... Come over here a little bit. It's whether that thousand years is literal or figurative. It's whether the second coming occurs before the thousand years or after the thousand years. All these things, they're hard to keep track of. They're hard to keep straight. And I've just given you some bullet points here, especially if you're taking notes that I hope you'll be able to use as a reference. The first type of millennialism that we're looking at is classic or historic premillennialism. And it's called that because... There were men in the second century who seemed to have some of these types of ideas, this view. Um, it's not because, well, for any other reason. It's because it's the oldest form of it. This view, okay, let's start with this, does not make a distinction between Israel and the church. So this is not the view that says, the church was an afterthought. The church, uh, Jesus failed in his mission, but when he comes back, he'll be successful. This view, classic premillennialism, uh, is, the, uh, is based on the idea that Israel and the church are God's people. Israel under the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament. And so the thousand-year reign won't just be Jews in, uh, in Israel. That won't, they won't be the only ones in his kingdom. Uh, we're going to have to go pretty quickly already. Uh, this flavor of millennialism does not require complete literal interpretation of all apocalyptic prophecy. Apocalyptic means regarding the end of time as well. Um, Revelation is apocalyptic literature. Uh, the end of Daniel is apocalyptic. The book of Ezekiel is a, uh, a, lot, a large portion of it is apocalyptic. And dispensationalism, which we're going to get to next, um, really hinges on literally interpreting those, 
passages, all of those passages, literally. Think about the visions and the, the wars that are described, the battles that are described, the animals and the beasts. All of that's literal. That's just, that's hard to accept on the outset. Classic does not require, except for the thousand-year reign, they say is literal. But, um, but it's not, not all apocalyptic literature has to be interpreted literally. Classic premillennialism holds that the church was in prophecy, existed, was in the minds of the prophets, in the mind of God, in many of the Old Testament prophecies. Um, that he did intend to, and it was part of his ultimate purpose. Now, here's the, the steps, the order in which they describe the end of time occurring. We are now in what they call the church age. I don't have a problem with that term. At some point, though, what's going to happen is the church is going to be raptured. And I like the way Brother, Brother Newell drew these with two arrows. Jesus... Second coming, coming down, and the church going up to meet them. Just meeting there in the, in the air. Um, they believe that at some point that's going to happen. The church is going to be raptured up. We talked about that word last week, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Caught up with him in the air is the idea there. And then after the rapture, where the church is raptured, there's going to be a period of Tribulation, seven years of tribulation. At the end of those seven years will begin the thousand-year literal reign of Jesus in Jerusalem on earth. So the church is raptured up. Meet Jesus in the air. <laughs> is that what you're doing? You're ready to go? And then they escort him back to earth where he establishes his throne and rules for literally a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, there's one final battle. He has that Satan, uh, Brother Newell has Satan bound in for a little season. There she is, y'all. Um, and, and that again comes from the book of Revelation. But... I mean, everywhere your source you go to is going to describe these events differently. And, and it's kind of hard to pinpoint, and nail down exactly uh, the specifics of all the facts that they believe about these events and the order of them. Um, but at the end of that thousand years, there will be that final battle, Armageddon, if you will. Satan is ultimately defeated. And then the, the NHNE, the new heavens and new earth, appear. So we're in the church age then the rapture, then the thousand years. So Jesus' second coming is before the thousand years, hence pre-millennialism, according to this view. And then the new heavens and the new earth uh, begin at the end of that thousand years. That's when judgment occurs. Confused? Me too. Uh, this... It's picking and choosing where to be literal and where to be figurative. It's inconsistent, um, and it is very much based upon a, um, a physical view of spiritual matters, wanting to materialize so much of what is going to be spiritual. But that that's the idea, I think, behind a lot of false doctrine. So much of it's rooted in, in covetousness, but say what? During that seven years. Mm -hmm. That seems to be, that would seem to be logical. Just wait until that time, then get your life right. So there's a lot of questions, Just, and I don't want us to get caught up here. We're already running out of time. But that's classical or historic premillennialism goes back to, um, yes, go to the next one now. The next view is dispensational 
premillennialism. It's really dispensationalism is, is how it's more commonly referred to now. All right, we're going to have to go quickly here. It's called dispensationalism because what they've done is organize the Bible into seven dispensations. Based on how God has interacted with man, and we kind of break down time into that in that manner as well, the patriarchal period, the Mosaic dispensation, and now we're in the church age, the Christian age, um, where God has spoken through his word. But they've broken down time into seven dispensations, and I want to give those to you. The period of innocence, Genesis 1 until the fall, until Adam and Eve sin. The period of conscience from the time of the first sin until after the flood. The time of human government, men began to organize into city-states and nations. Think about Babel, Genesis chapter 9 through chapter 11. The fourth is the era of promise. Genesis 12 begins with God's promises to Abraham. And from that time until Sinai, they're under uh, promise. I, I, these are kind of understandable to me. I just don't know why they break it down into such small categories. Uh, I think they're missing the big picture here. At Mount Sinai, beginning in Exodus chapter 20, until the day of Pentecost, they call the period of law. And that's what the Jews were under. Beginning at Pentecost, they call the era of grace, which is what we're under now and will last until the thousand years begin. And that thousand years then will usher in the millennial kingdom. So they've broken down history, time, into these seven dispensations instead of the three that we recognize. Um, and these aren't, we don't, break them down into these three categories, the patriarchal, mosaic, and, and Christian, because the Bible describes them that way. It's just we've taken the information in the Bible and kind of categorized it that way. That's kind of what this is as well. But, uh, but we don't see those singular events separating these. Well, I guess kind of we do too. But um, things didn't change in the way that God... I don't know. I have to look into that a little bit more. The way God communicated with man. But that's why it's called dispensationalism. Now, to get to, really to contrast it with historic or classical premillennialism. Uh, no, no, not yet. In this view, Israel and the church are distinct entities. So, Israel is God's people, always were, always will be, and the church was that stopgap um, uh, that I still can't find it parenthetical statement that God inserted to get us to the time when Jesus would return so that it, really the idea is that only Jews will be part of that thousand year earthly reign when Jesus does return this view does require literal interpretation of all apocalyptic literature to be consistent all the different beasts that are amalgamations of all different kinds of things, all the vials and bowls and books that are open in Revelation, all just absolutely literal. Even though John says in chapter 1 of Revelation, as he's beginning, these things I signified, I set in symbol. They, that's, what, that's the way Jesus gave them to me. It's all symbolic. According to this view, Jesus returns to take Christians to heaven. So we're, again, in the church age, and Brother Newell here has included references to Daniel, chapter 9 especially. I didn't get into all of that because um, that's a rabbit hole that's hard to come out of. But we're still in the church age. When the rapture occurs, Jesus returns for the church, for the saints. Now, this is the view that was made popular by that Left Behind series of books, and uh, they even made movies out of it, 
Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. You can still find those books uh, all over the place. But the rapture will be secret. And that's where you see these bumper stickers uh, if, you, if this car is driverless or whatever it is, you know the rapture's occurred. It'll be secret. Nobody will know. They'll just disappear. Christians, the church, uh, the saved. Um, but it will be a secret rapture. And then we'll enter into the period of tribulation, which uh, will be seven years. Again, all the Christians are gone during this tribulation. That's not a time for people to get their life right. That's really gone. This is, during, this is where the Antichrist to them rules the world. He's taken over. There's the mark of the beast. We have chips in our bodies or whatever else. This is all that fantastical thing, things that anybody could come up with is, is all part of this, that time especially, the tribulation. And the tribulation ends again with... Um, Armageddon, a literal battle, Satan and his forces, Jesus and his forces, and Jesus, of course, will be victorious. Um, but that all happens before the second coming. So the rapture occurred secretly, Christians disappeared, Christ returned for them but didn't come to earth. The second coming, when he comes back to earth, is after the tribulation, and then the thousand-year literal rule again begins after the thousand years there is the resurrection of the unjust and what they refer to as the great white throne judgment described in revelation 20 verse 11 um i'm not gonna have time for this um and then we enter into eternity the new heavens and the new earth again it's very physical Heaven's going to be a rejuvenated earth. Um, and we're going to have to talk more about that concept as well in coming days and weeks. But this one, so the difference between classical and dispensational, besides these dispensations, uh, they're very similar, um, but is especially in the symbolic versus literal, literal view of apocalyptic literature. Even more confused now? I know it's not easy. Okay. It is wrong. It is. We're going to get to... I, I wasn't here when Brother Clifford preached on what happens to our souls after we die a few weeks ago. And that's a question that's connected with this study as well. I agree with everything he said in that lesson. So next we're going to look at post-millennialism. Okay, so in both of those views, the second return of Christ preceded the thousand-year reign. Next, we have post-millennialism. So this is another form of millennialism, which are all eschatological views, views regarding the end of time. According to post-millennialism, this is very symbolic. All of it is symbolic. And that's respectable, but this one almost is more unbelievable to me than premillennialism. Jesus establishes his kingdom on earth through preaching, through, the, through, the, through Christians, his disciples, executing the Great Commission. And that's honorable, and that's true, but we'll, we'll see the, the flaw in this one really easily. According to postmillennialism, Righteousness is increasing and will continue to increase in the millennium. He has on here, and we talked about this before, that post-millennialism, most people hold that that thousand years is literal. Well, if that was the case, according to this, it would have begun with, really with Pentecost, and it only lasted for a thousand years if it was literal. Most people who are post-millennialists today don't think of the millennium, the thousand years, as literal. But it's the view that as we go through time, righteousness is winning. It expects that eventually the vast majority of people living will be saved, will be converted to Christ. 
what does Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14 say? It says that it's always going to be the few who are on the road to heaven and the majority are on the road to destruction. That's always going to be the case. 2 Timothy 3, 13 says evil men and seducers wax worse and worse. They're getting worse and worse. It's just, I don't know that our percentage is getting any higher or ever has. We have to maintain it. We have to keep going. We have to try to convert as many as possible. But I think as population grows, the percentage of those who are living right may even be smaller. But according to post-millennialism, the gospel has that effect. It's going to eventually convert the vast majority of people living at that time. And so this increasing success will introduce this golden age, this millennium, in a time when righteousness flourishes in the affairs of men and nations before Christ's second coming. So Christ won't return until pretty much the whole world is good, until the, pretty much the whole world has been converted and is uh, saved. And then history ends with a general resurrection and final judgment. And then um, we enter into our final, into eternity. Like I said, some still hold that the millennium, the thousand years, is literal, uh, who are post-millennialists, but most now consider that thousand years as figurative. Now, here's the problem with that. The word post doesn't necessarily mean, it isn't a reference to Christ's return after, uh, uh, after the tribulation or after the thousand years, but post indicates, according to this view, that Christ will return after Christians have succeeded in establishing Christ's kingdom on earth. That that's not Jesus' view. That's not Jesus' role, his purpose. That's not his job. But we are in the process now of establishing his kingdom. And then Jesus will return. Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He came to build his church, Matthew 16. And... That is the kingdom. So, it's not in the hands of man. It's not up to us to establish the kingdom. And that, to me, is the problem with post-millennialism. All right, one more. And this is ah-millennialism. I've only ever heard it ah-millennialism, not a-millennialism. Um, and this one, you might... <laughs> I try to avoid all of these terms for myself, but I, I wouldn't have a problem with anyone referring to themselves as an amillennialist. Um, but according to this view of eschatology, the end of time, there's no millennial reign on earth by the righteous or by Jesus himself. Um, all apocalyptic literature is to be understood symbolically. The thousand years refer symbolically either to the temporary bliss of souls in paradise or heaven before the general resurrection or to the infinite bliss after the general re resurrection in that eternal state. And again, that thousand years is only found, the only reference to this millennium, to this thousand years, is in Revelation chapter 20. Nowhere else in Scripture is that described or referred to um, there I don't know I just I have a different view of revelation probably than a lot of people we're not getting into that now but um, but I try to avoid any of these terms even a millennial but I know it can be confusing and I probably didn't clear up anything for you thank um, uh, but that uh, maybe will get you started on a little, a little deeper study for yourself, and to come back to it. Well, let me mention. Let me ask this first: How can we defeat these errors regarding eschatology, premillennialism, postmillennialism? How can we defeat that? I think that's it. I think it all centers around pre
preaching the truth regarding the church. And that's what frustrates me so much today with even people in the church, preachers within the church, who are trying to suggest the notion that people in denominations can be saved. And I hate to say it any other, I hate to say it that way, because I know that can hurt people to, to say, but when we understand the nature of the church, the, the purpose of the church, the book that was up here, I, I just moved it Sunday, that you, I know you studied for a little while before we got here. The Bible makes the only Christians and Christians only. That will always be the case. And if we understand God's purpose of the church, I think we can defeat these ideas. Now, which one is correct? What's the truth about what's going to happen at the end of time? I don't know. I don't know. Do I have to know? Is it going to determine whether I go to heaven or hell based on what I believe is going to happen at the end of time? If I'm not here to see it, I don't know what's going to happen. My role and my job is to live faithfully according to what God's Word says. Make, become a disciple of Jesus Christ right here and now. To do as much as I can with my life while I'm living. I leave the end of time up to God. And that's why I try to avoid any of these descriptions or um, tags. Premillennial, postmillennial, or amillennial. Uh, now, who believes these different things? And Now, to get us back to blessed assurance... Fanny J. Crosby, as we mentioned, was a Presbyterian, and they, for the most part, are of the amillennial view. And that's why I say I don't believe that when she wrote Visions of Rapture um, that she was referring to a secret rapture or a premillennial rapture. I, I don't know that she believed that. Now, I've never sat down with a in a Bible study with anyone who was clear on any of this, who could say, I believe that this is what's going to happen at the end of time. This is the order of things. I am a dispensational premillennialist. I am a pre-tribulationer. I mean, I've never sat down with anyone who had given this much thought. But the um, theologians of our time, they love to throw around these terms, these descriptions, and these names. I believe what this person believed. I believe what this person believed. And, and, and it's just all about building themselves up. But that's the nature of these false doctrines. Um, but again, just to try to give you a, a little clarification on some of those categories, I know that uh, we probably didn't clarify very much, but that'll give you some reference that you can make in further study for yourself. Now, next week, I intend to finish up Blessed Assurance, and we then will start the week after on Zion's Glorious Summit too. but don't hold me to that either. <laughs> All right, any questions or comments before we wrap it up? Yeah, let's just be done with this. Yes, sir? That type of thinking shows a lot of folks, that type of people that and that's why I said. That kind of stuff that sells a lot of books and just train load that train load of books. Yes, sir. Print, print, <clears throat> and so, and it's not true because people like to yes. delve into things of mysterious. Yes, and that's why I say all false doctrines rooted in covetousness. Uh, it does sell a lot of books. These fantastic images—they make good movies, they make good TV, but it's not literal. It's not to be taken literally, and God didn't intend it to be that. We need to know a little bit about it, though, because as our children go off to school, they're going to come under these influences. Yes. And then when they bring that home, we say, I don't understand what's going on. Uh, you know, they're going to make these, but they're lost. Uh, so we need to be familiar enough with it so that we can. I think that. That is the idea. That's our motivation. It behooves us to familiarize ourselves with these terms and these uh, these positions because we want to be able to defend against them uh, and teach our children the truth. But 
we could go on. There's other, there's other eschatological views besides just premillennial, postmillennial. So, yes, that's a, that's a controversial passage when it comes to these things as well. Three questions. Nobody looks at it as three questions. Yes, agreed. Yes. When will these things be? What will be the signs and those those things? Yes. There's different things taking place there. Yes, sir. I know when it comes time for the second coming, God's not gonna consult with me on his schedule and he's gonna handle what needs to happen. I think one very valuable thing to be especially teaching your kid about eschatology is I think the world has this image of Jesus that is weak and it's mm -hmm. frail and pleading and, and oh what are you and there, there's this other coming that's coming that we know is gonna happen and I don't have a real good grip on the thousand years of the tribulation. Right. There's stuff that's gonna happen. A lot of prophesied I'm not sure how it's gonna fall out exactly but he's not going to he's gonna be coming stronger version of Jesus than I think most people in the world uh, see him as right now. I think that, that image that when he comes back, he's coming back in glory, and he's coming back as the judge, and he's coming back to, to settle a lot of accounts. Well, I agree that the popular view of Jesus is incorrect, that it is of a weak and um, Meek, yes, and weak mixed up, and that shouldn't be the case. Uh, but I, I don't know. At the end of time, it's, it's going to happen the way God wants it to happen. Everything's going to be burned up. Time will be no more. Physical existence won't, won't occur anymore. We'll be translated into a spiritual existence. His return, what it's going to look like, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time even worrying about it because it'll happen the way it's going to happen. And what I believe about how it's going to happen isn't going to change how it happens. So, blink of an eye, exactly. That is, that is true. It's going to happen in the blink of an eye. All right. We went over a little bit, and uh, there'll be more time to, to talk about these things. We may have to, have to do a class, dig a little deeper. But thank you so much. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth. It is so simple, Father, and it is in our hands. We pray that we will diligently study it, apply it in our lives, and live faithfully. Father, we pray that Jesus will come quickly. Our world is, is sinful, it is wicked, and it's getting worse. Father, we pray that, that your will be done, and that righteousness might prevail. We pray that we will be diligent in spreading the, the message of truth, and that we might bring souls to you as soon as possible. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all the hope that we have through him. In his name we pray. Amen.